Java 17 was released yesterday. It is not just another version of Java. It's a long-term support release. What does it mean for us developers, our applications, and enterprises? What are the features that we should be looking at? More importantly, why? And how IntelliJ IDEA can help? Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of IntelliJ IDEA. IntelliJ IDEA live stream. Sorry, I missed that part. My name is Mark. <laughs> Today we have an expert to find out how to get ready for Java 17. We'll be asking a lot of questions, but we have just enough. Would be uh, would that time be enough to answer all the questions? Maybe yes, maybe no. What we definitely want to do with today's session is to encourage you to start with the conversations around Java 17 if you haven't already done so. Let me welcome the experts for the session today. Nikola Parlog from Oracle. Hi, hi Mala. Thanks for having me. Hi, Nikolai. It's a pleasure to have you today. Nikolai will talk about all the amazing Java features. Taki Rally from JetBrains. Oh, nice to see you. Uh, Taki will talk about how IntelliJ IDEA makes it easy for us to work with new Java features. Trisha G from JetBrains. Hiya. Uh, it's kind of weird to welcome you like this. And <laughs> I have to remind my, uh, myself that it's not our usually monthly or uh, weekly meeting. <laughs> and I want to uh, uh, Warren, Nikolai, and Tagi, uh, because Trisha is going to play the role of a curious developer, and she would be asking a lot of questions, and I would be moderating the session. And before we get started, uh, quick housekeeping details. Everyone who's watching, please use YouTube chat to ask questions. We won't have slides or presentations today. It's more of a conversation, and we'll try to answer your questions as you post them. The session will be recorded and hosted to IntelliJ Ideas YouTube channel. So if you haven't already subscribed to our channel, please do that now. And last but not the least, if you like today's session, please do not miss to like this video. So Nikolai, I want to start the session by asking a question to you. Everyone's excited about Java 17. What are, what are you excited about? So it's actually not, not an easy question. It's just about seven. Like, where am I coming from? Can I come from 16 or from 11 or from 8 or from Java 4? I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's a tricky question because developers would be on uh, different versions of Java. Yeah. So you would have to take a call and answer the question accordingly. Okay, let, let's start with a short list then. Let's say I come from 16. <laughs> uh, so then, first of all, I probably don't have to incentivize you to go to 17 because as far as I'm aware, nobody's going to give you any security updates. So you're probably on 17 already or should be in the next coming days. What you get for that, besides you know, all the internal improvements, larger and small, like bigger features, is probably sealed classes, which is out of preview. You could experiment with that before, and now it's done. You know, but permittedly, like without some of the other pattern matching features, it's not going to do a whole lot in your code base yet. Uh, it really needs these other pieces to fit together, which are already in preview, which you can experiment with, uh, which were not, you know, not yet really done. And so you probably shouldn't bet too much production code on that. Another thing that I really liked is the enhanced random number generator API. It's one of these typical like small improvements that may fly under the radar. But the old API was a bit weird. I tend to I use the word muddied for it because it's not like it's a bad API. It's just you know you have like four classes, somewhat unrelated, with different APIs, but all the same code. And now it just all makes much more sense and it's more feature proof. Um, so it's like one of these really like random. I'm oh, sorry, not random. One of these uh, static improvements uh, that we get. And the last one that weirdly I'm really happy about is a strong encapsulation. <laughs> the fact that uh, stuff breaks harder if you if we use things that we're not supposed to. Uh, because I really think that it's very important that we stop using things we're not supposed to, so Java can evolve more easily. And so then, you know, if 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 if, if a JVM or if the JDK as a whole is screaming at you loudly that you're doing something you're not supposed to, that helps along that road. And even though it's mainly going to come across as a hindrance, I really think it's like you know the the, the safety belt on the car is usually used as a metaphor, which like it's. Yes, it's easier if you don't use it, but you'll be happy to have used it uh, overall over a lifetime of driving a car, probably. So yeah, those are the things in 17. And then if you go go back further to 11, and then there's so much more in there. I mean, you know, like you get text blocks, you get records, you get a ton of other API improvements. Uh, what else do we have? String API, I think, got a little improvement. Uh, stream got a new method. Complete with Future got a couple of new methods. Uh, frameworks can now create hidden classes. So frameworks spin uh, classes at runtime. They now have a special little low-level feature that allows that to do that more easily and more robustly. So there are tons of, of, of these small improvements. So I think the really big ones is probably text blocks and records. Those are two great productivity features that really make everyday programming uh, 
easier, more expressive, and more productive, I guess. So I want to ask some questions at this point, if that's OK. Um, <laughs> so I, I think it's absolutely true that the, the great question you asked at the beginning was like, um, where are you coming from? Because we have these releases every six months now. And um, <clears throat> and we have this idea of like long-term support releases too. So it seems that if you read a lot of the, um, the ecosystem surveys and stuff a lot of developers are still online of uh, eight there are a bunch of people on 11 um and then a smattering of people in between 11 and, and 17. so i just kind of i guess i wanted to ask you from a little bit from oracle's point of view since you do work for oracle like what's the significance of the long-term support releases versus the other releases um yeah so uh that's that's actually a, a, an intricate question because from like from the perspective of the open jdk project and code base from that perspective like like uh, long term support is not really a thing right it's like if you just look at the open jdk you might wonder why you, why java jdk 11 the update project for that gets so many updates and fixes and JDK 12 doesn't get any, and 10 doesn't get any either. Right? So if you're just inside that bubble, you can tell that 11 has a special status. But the fact that some vendors, basically, I think all of them at this point, but provide long-term support for specifically version 11, and then now also for 17, that's basically something that's uh, that the individual vendors decide on the outside to decide like, that's the version that uh, we want to invest uh, money and time in supporting. And uh, so obviously for the vendors, it's actually not the worst thing in the world that people are on old versions because you know at some point you got to pay for support. But like Oracle and specifically the Java Platform Group uh, has no problems at all with every. There's a smattering after 11, which is kind of weird because once again, probably everybody should be on the latest if you're after 11 because you know of the thing with the long-term support. Um, but the thing is that uh, if you're always on the latest version then uh, you can always have that definitely for free with the recent with all the security patches and everything and um i think that's a great place to be in and i feel that more projects can do that than did in the past and what i really hope is that when they go from 11 to 17 they will notice i mean if you go from 8 to 11 i understand that you feel kind of like wow that could have depending on your project maybe it was a lot of work or at least some work some bumps in the road there and then if you think oh my god that was just three versions and i have to do six um, so I can see where people maybe were hesitant to go from 11 to 17, but they will see that not only were the releases much smaller, there were also a much, 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 much lower footprint when it comes to anything that could potentially break. Between 11 and 17, there's really just uh, like strong encapsulation, which I mentioned, and a couple of old things that are removed. Basically, that's all that can happen to you there. And I think many projects will succeed in that update. And then they will no maybe notice that wasn't that bad. You know, maybe we can try this 18 things when it comes around in six months. And so when it doesn't, um, like when that happens, and then it's only three more versions till the next long-term support, probably, uh, since we get that every four versions now. So I really hope that more people will try staying on the most recent release, uh, because I really think that's, that's where it's at. I, I have a couple of other questions to follow up here, but I think maybe I'll leave, I'll, I'll leave that for now, and maybe we'll come back to them in a minute. <laughs> Um, so I, uh, Nicola, I completely understand what you mean by testing with the new uh, versions as they come out, because we are also talking about the Oracle dropping or changing APIs and dropping features. So it's uh, good for uh, developers to test the applications against the new versions. But there's also a fear of uh, the unknown of moving to uh, the new versions. And now I want to talk with Targi regarding this, because I have seen a lot of developers who uh, talk about how easy it is for the developers to work with the new uh, features of Java when they are working with IntelliJ IDEA, because uh, JetBrains IntelliJ IDEA supports the new features in IntelliJ IDEA as soon as they are out. So Targi, how easy or difficult it is to support the new features, because I know uh, developers can work with them as soon as they are out. And uh, I also want to talk uh, with you about how difficult it is to change a feature when it, uh, uh, I'm talking about the preview feature. What happens when the preview feature changes and how does that affect the development process for IntelliJ IDEA? Yeah, it's uh, completely not easy to support new features. It's uh, a big amount of work. And uh, uh, of course, uh, external users sometimes are not uh, aware how much of work internally should be done to uh, make the support. Uh, for example, I took a look 
for the newest preview feature, pattern matching and switches. And uh, we have uh, some kind of dashboard or something like this. And it includes uh, 62 tickets. Uh, it includes uh, improvements and bug fixes, everything uh, of which for now uh, about 40 are already resolved. So we are still in progress. Uh, and uh, uh, I must say that all of this is done by, uh, not by me, of course, but our wonderful team of many people. And uh, it, uh, it uh, includes uh, improving internal model of the code. For example, uh, before uh, we had uh, case labels and switch, uh, and all of them were ex expressions, but now they could be not only expressions, but also patterns. Uh, we need to improve parser, uh, and we have unified parser for all Java versions at once. So if you start typing uh, uh, case pattern in Java 8 project, it will still be passed and you will have nice error message like, oh, sorry, but patterns are not supported in Java 8. Would you like to uh, bump your version? Not just like uh, this is completely syntactic error and we don't know anything about this. So the parser should understand all versions back. And uh, then it's symbol resolution. Like if you refer to pattern variable, you should be able to uh, know where it's declared and how to rename it. So going back and forth from declaration to references and so on. After that, it's error highlighting. Uh, for example, for switch patterns, it's uh, type compatibility, dominance, uh, changes in fall through handling and so on. Uh, if you have errors, you would like to see quick fixes on errors. Sometimes it's old quick fixes, sometimes it's new. Uh, you would expect that completion works as expected. For example, if you complete pattern, you should see options there and it also it just works, but to make it work and <laughs> we should add support for this. Uh, and uh, we should also improve uh, intention actions and inspections. For example, uh, we have conversion from if to switch and from switch to if, from old style switch to new style switch and so on. And all of this uh, should be uh, improved much to support new patterns because now you can convert much more ifs in your code into switches. And of course, uh, you should be able to do this. Uh, and uh, we also need to fix many, many bugs in existing code because uh, many code just assume, okay, I have a switch label, I can get an expression from it, but oops, there is no expression, now it's pattern, and what should I do with it? That code was completely unaware, and now we should fix all of this. And there are also many, many small details, like, for example, control flow graph, because uh, before, uh, if you have switch without default, it was assumed that uh, the next statement after the switch is always executed. Now, if you have a switch, it could be total switch. So next statement could be unreachable and this also should be updated. There is a lot of, a lot of work. And uh, we try to support uh, all preview features as soon as they are released. I see the question in the chat, uh, when we will have Java 17 support in IntelliJ ID and the answer that we already have it uh, in the latest uh, released uh, version uh, 2021.2.1. Uh, we already have uh, not uh, completely polished, but uh, quite a good thing to start. You can already start playing with Java 17, including preview features in uh, already released uh, IntelliJ idea. Of course, in uh, our uh, next release, uh, 21.3, the support will be much, much better. Uh, and uh, the problem with preview features is that uh, they are changing. And uh, sometimes they are changing in incompatible ways. Uh, for example, uh, the biggest headache was uh, change in switch expression in Java 12. Uh, it was break with value. So uh, 
uh, you could either break with label or break with value, and that value would be the result of switch expression. And uh, we already had break statement, and you can imagine in internal API it could return the label, but now it could be either label or expression, and uh, we should do some non-trivial check whether it's label or expression because uh, they are quite similar. Uh, you break and some name after that, you don't know whether this name is expression or label. But uh, so we change it API, change it syntax tree, and change it everything. And all of this was just thrown away because uh, Oracle guys decided, okay, we don't need break, we need a yield statement. <laughs> Taki, at this point, I, I feel like I should say something. Uh, first of all, thank you, and also sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the work you're doing is amazing and so important, but at the same time, like I knew you had a lot of work with this, but I didn't know it was that much. <laughs> wow. I was I mean, going to say that as well. I, I think that what's amazing, like as a user of IntelliJ Ideas, that you, you, you use it with the latest version of Java, and it just works. And you think, OK, that's easy. <laughs> it was easy for me. <laughs> But I mean, not so much for Tagir. I, I didn't know that, but I, well, I, I know for a couple of years now, but initially I didn't because uh, you're not just using the Java C compiler, right? Everything you just said, I could just say, like, why don't you just use the Java C compiler? But IntelliJ entirely re implements that logic, right? For all the things that you mentioned for proposing variable refact and refactorings and all of that. And that's so you basically have like what, like a Java, the, the entire new compiler running, uh, running there, right? Something yes, like I guess we, we have like. 70% of compiler implemented in Java. We have all front end, all resolution, all type inference. It's really non trivial part. The only thing we don't have is code generation. So, mm -hmm. front end part uh, and no back end, but it's still, I guess, bigger part of the compiler. And uh, you can imagine that uh, it's completely independent implementation. It's uh, our own code. And uh, you can imagine that it always differs in details. So uh, sometimes you can see some like compilation error in IntelliJ, but everything is fine in Java yeah. C or vice versa. And uh, it's not always uh, our problem. Sometimes it's Java C problem, or sometimes it's specification problem because specification is written in unclear way. And uh, we are always trying to solve this. So if we see some discrepancy, we d discuss it with Oracle guys in uh, uh, open JDK mailing lists. And uh, sometimes we see like, OK, this is a problem in specification. This is a problem in IntelliJ, or this is a problem in Java C. I think this is like this really shines a light on how important the specification is for Java, right? Everything you describe would basically be, well, not impossible, but so much harder even if we didn't have like a specification, if you basically would have to re-engineer Java C's behavior. Uh, and then you like now you know okay you know where's the problem is it a specification problem is it a Java C problem is it an IntelliJ problem it would be so much harder if we just take this specification out of it and it's not like you know there are more compilers than that, those two even so uh, that would be so much worse than if basically a bunch of projects are fighting over who's right luckily there's a specification exactly. that tells exactly. that, that, tells that. I'm, I must say big thanks to Oracle because a Java specification is really great it's uh, really easy to read. Uh, I had read many software specifications and Java specification is well written. So you can just open it and uh, start implementing the feature you want. Uh, and uh, if there are some problems, it's uh, also clear. And uh, we have uh, feedback, we have access to drafts. So uh, much before the Java 17 is released, we already see drafts and uh, we can work with them. Otherwise, it would be impossible, of course, to implement everything uh, just uh, when Java 17 comes out. I wanted to pick up a little bit on this theme, actually. I think what's one of the things that's successful about, about Java is the, the community involvement and the interaction between the different parties. So the specification is part of that because the specification allows um, JetBrains to implement the, the specification in the IDEs. And, and the, the you mentioned as well open JDK mailing lists and sort of transparency thing. The fact that we have early access releases of, of a version of Java. We have um, IntelliJ implementing the specifications and trying to provide functionality in advance. And then talking, uh, JetBrains talking to Oracle and the developers talking to us or to Oracle. I think all of this works really nicely to, to create 
a set of tools that helps developers to really create the things they're trying to do. I mean, they the developers don't necessarily care about the Java specification. They're trying to solve someone's business problem. But the fact that the specification and the environment and the communications allow us to deliver solutions that developers can use, I think is a really powerful part of, of the Java ecosystem. And what is really great is that uh, uh, external developers not from Oracle can really uh, participate in uh, design and development of new features via mailing lists. Uh, I uh, I participate in Ember Project Expert Group. Uh, if, if you don't know, Ember Project is where all new language features of Java are born. And uh, long before specification is written, long before there is uh, some draft implementation of new feature, there are many design talks about uh, how to implement this or that feature better and so on. And uh, uh, of course, uh, it's mainly uh, among expert group, but uh, it's also possible for external people to participate in uh, spec comments mailing lists. And uh, if you have great ideas, uh, there is chance that they will be implemented. Uh, so, Tagi, when you said earlier that the people at Oracle changed break to yield, wasn't that the Amber expert group who made that decision? Yes. <laughs> Which includes yes. who again? Who's on that group again that you just mentioned? <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, but what, you, what, we, what we just talked about, we mentioned, you know, generates a lot and we mentioned Oracle a lot. I think it's important to note that OpenJDK is, uh, of course, of course, because all of these many people, not all of this, but many of them uh, do that full time. And, you know, since we all want to, you know, eat and have a, have a house over our head, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, want to live in some, some house, uh, we all have bills to pay. And yes, there are companies behind that, right? Companies pay those individuals. But OpenJDK is first and foremost uh, a project and a group of, of individuals working together on this. Uh, and I don't want to say that, as I said, there are no corporations behind that. Obviously, there are. Uh, but that's what it's foremost is, right? So that means everybody really who has, for example, if you have a, um, if you try out a preview build of Java 18 at the moment, I, th I think you can already get Java 19 in a couple of weeks too. Um, so let's say you have a preview build of that, and then you notice a problem, or you say, "Look, look, this preview feature. I went to our code base, and I spent a day, and you know, I found all of these situations where it worked great, and there's this one situation where it didn't. Or I see this performance regression with the newest early access build. All of that, like there is no like corporate channel that you have to take to go through. All you need to do is like subscribe to the mailing list, uh, find the right one, which is probably the biggest task. And search engine optimization of the OpenJDK mailing list is basically non-existent. I often don't find things that I know that exist." because I quote them somewhere, but I don't, didn't write the, the link down. So that's a challenge. But other than that, once you found the right mailing list and put your feedback there, um, that's, that's, that's great feedback. And everybody can do that. And that's, I think, a big upside to what Mala said earlier. No matter what version you're on, like, unless really it's like Java 4, you should probably build against the early access build of the latest Java versions. And if not all of your projects build fine, you know, if some of them, the tests don't run, or uh, I don't know what, what else could go wrong, just exclude those, right? If you have like, a, let's say, Maven or Gradle build with like a with like 50 sub-projects, or you have like 100 microservices, just build the 80 that work. Just build the 40 sub-projects that work that you know or th that should work. Um, and when, when a new one of those fails, you know why. Like you can look into it. Like is it a bug in the preview feature, or does this show you a new change that's coming up uh, that might uh, negatively impact your project? So I think that's a really big chance and something that you can easily do. It doesn't have to be every build either, right? It's not like you need to have every build in your pipeline run against JDK 18 EA. It's perfectly fine to just do this nightly and uh, have a nightly build that does that just to give you the confidence that you know what's coming. And if something uh, happens that is unexpected, gives you a chance to analyze it and then, you know, take it back to the mailing lists. This is what the big upside of the openness is, but in, which is not the case, but in the worst case, if nobody would make use of it, then it would be all so pointless. So it's really great for each individual and each company and each project that uses these early access builds and does report back any findings that they have. I think that the thing that you mentioned earlier, Tagir, about the, the change in the um, 
uh, switch expressions where we went from break to yield. I think that was very much a, a case of real developers using it and going, uh, it's weird, I don't like it, right? I think that was one of those things where getting the preview features out there into developers' hands, then being able to use it through something like IntelliJ IDEA and then feedback through the mailing list and say, this isn't working for us because, and then usually giving like some specific set of code of examples that perhaps the, the, the language developers haven't thought of. It's, I think it's a really nice feedback loop of being able to improve everything for everybody. Yeah, and I want to really uh, say how important it is that uh, tools like uh, IntelliJ, for example, generally IDEs, um, but also other tooling around that tries to adopt this as early as possible. And I think JetBrains or IntelliJ does a really good job at that. Because, of course, I can experiment with these features and then compile by hand. But that's so much more work, right? That's the, the reason for preview features is to make it easier to experiment with them. So you don't have to download an Amber early access build somewhere and then you know unpack that locally and then figure that out. But that you can very easily with the JDK you already downloaded, just flip a switch and experiment. Uh, so it's about making these ex making these uh, changes more accessible before they're finalized. And uh, doing that in the tool that I already use is, of course, of great value, right? If I can just go into my IDE and say, OK, enable preview for like the rest of the afternoon. Let me just experiment with this. Once again, of course, I could just do this in a text editor and compile by hand if my IDE isn't happy with it. I learned to, by the way, occasionally ignore uh, if IntelliJ just paints everything red. Like if, you, if I experiment with a new feature and everything's red, I'm just like, ah, well, apparently it's not, a, it's not fully supported yet. I just keep typing and hope Java C saves me in the end. Uh, so, um, right, so that makes it so much more comfortable and so much more uh, accessible to experiment with these features. So that's that's the great thing in general. I think that uh, many projects are aware of these uh, of these of this you know six months cadence changes, and I think there's great support overall. But I really think IntelliJ specifically does a stellar job. And I'm not just saying that because you invited me. I occasionally say that in other places too. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, I guess not only uh, IDE benefits from preview features. Uh, for example, when uh, records were implemented as preview feature in Java 14, uh, uh, a ticket appeared in uh, Jackson serialization library. Like, okay, there are records and we can nicely serialize them to json and back just using components not digging into dirty reflection and reading fields uh, uh, there and uh, they actually implemented it uh, when it was at preview stage so when uh, this feature was standardized uh, you can see library is already supported completely and it was already tested so it's great yeah true uh, Nicola, I, um, since you are in the room, I want to talk about modules and I want to talk about uh, uh, features which uh, kind of some in misinformation gets attached to those features, which kind of hinders the uh, adoption of those features or moving to new Java versions. So uh, I know a lot of developers, uh, they are unaware that they don't really need to use JPMS to move to uh, Java 9 and uh, beyond versions. So are there any other features to which similar misinformation has been attached in the past? Or uh, if you talk about 8 to 17, or if you want to talk about any feature which is specific to 17 or otherwise? Yeah, so, uh, so so the question is not about modules after all. That's great, because nobody likes them. Nobody wants to talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just me and Sander Mac and probably Mark Ryan. That's all the people in the world who <laughs> like them. <laughs> no, seriously, though, I think uh, modules were a very important uh, change uh, internally, obviously, for the um, for the JDK code base. But I think it will also uh, have a very positive, even though hard to measure, very like a low-level constant positive value, like the seat belts I mentioned earlier. Um, for the entire ecosystem that will take some time to unfold. But yes, you asked about other non-module related stuff. That's actually, I don't know, like most of the things that are here, like you can't update past eight, everybody is still on eight, you know, I have to like modules break everything and you know, J-Link only works with modules. So I think all the stuff that I know in that era is all related to modules, which is kind of weird now that I think about it. Um, what else is there? Yeah, of course there's a thing that, um, Happened specifically with Java 9, but also afterwards, which is that uh, you know Java Java is breaking more stuff. Java is Java's using uh, is moving faster, and it's less compatible than in the past. And um, I think like eighty percent of that is actually like a, like a massive exaggeration. But it's in that sense not totally untrue that yes, uh, the Java Platform Group has made some moves to remove old craft in the end, like stuff that is uh, that is still used. It's not like nobody uses it, but it's rarely used, and it often has an oversized uh, impact on the on the resources that it takes up. 
Uh, one example, which uh, is still in place, and there are no, uh, no uh, deprecation uh, plans for that at all. But that I want to mention is because it's so often mentioned serialization, right? If you look one of the, if you look at one of these interviews uh, and the ask me anything's with the architects. And there's always a question like, what feature do you hate most? And the answer, like serialization is such a, it became such a staple answer that people actually, okay, let me tell you number two and three on the list because number one is obvious. <laughs> so like every developer who works on the JDK, OpenJDK hates serialization with a passion because it interferes with every feature. And my favorite story there is Lambdas. Uh, Brian Getz tells a story that when it came to Lambdas, serialization uh, took up way more time than it should have. And if you think about it, Lambdas are about coding behavior and serialization is about you know writing data to disk you would think there should be no connection at all but that is entirely wrong because you can serialize anything including you know what the lambda has turned to into a namely an instance of a functional interface so there you go bam now you have to talk about lambdas and serialization and so this is a big feature that impacts every other language feature that gets introduced and uh, that is the case for some of these other things as well. Uh, the security managers that get deprecated, for example. There are a couple of things that have a much larger amount of resources that say they take up during development, then they provide overall value to the ecosystem. And there's a call to be made, right? Like if it's a little bit off of balance, then okay, that, that's, that's acceptable. But if the, if the more it gets out of balance, the more the question arises, like what should we do about it? And uh, in the admittedly somewhat unlikely, but still in the case that you rely on these technologies, I perfectly understand that that sucks, right? Having something deprecated and then removed that you rely on, that sucks. And being told, well, it's just you and nine other <laughs> projects, but we're a million Java developers out there. That's not really gonna make you feel better. I understand that, but it's still, um, it's still um, the, op the, the, the other option would be, well, we can't remove anything ever and can't change anything ever. Uh, and that would probably not be a good situation to be in either. And so that's that's basically the twenty percent. I think the other eighty percent were Java breaks stuff. That's often stuff that we shouldn't have been using or shouldn't have been relying on, right? If you use uh, internal APIs, if you rely on, um, for example, I once saw code. I kid, I kid you not. That needed to. Um, what was that? I think it was looking for the bind. No, it was look right. It was looking for the Java C binary. And the way it did that, it would uh, get the path of the Java launcher that launched the program. It would look into the same bin folder to see whether Java C is there. And if it isn't, it knows, well, maybe I'm running in a, J in a the JRE, which is embedded in a JDK, which was like all in Java 8. So I just go one level up and then go in the bin folder. And then maybe there in that bin folder, there's a Java C. That's not what we're not supposed to do that. That's like, that's, <laughs> not, that's not standardized. That's not described anywhere. That's like, I know why it worked. But then it stopped working. And uh, so those kind of things are often a part of what breaks, which is internals that we started to rely upon because they didn't change for such a long time. But at the same time, they can change at some point. And then it's not, and I think I think this is not a technicality. It's not a, it's not a breaking change. It's not an incompatibility. It's just changing an internal. It's like if I come to you as a user of IntelliJ and say, aha. But you named this very renamed this variable in one of your classes, so now IntelliJ broke my workflow. I don't know. So that would be weird, right? And I think that applies there as well. So I think a lot of the incompatibilities that we've been seeing is uh, people not probably not themselves because very few projects, relatively speaking, I think, use these internals directly, but like indirectly depending on them. And of course, that you know creates this these kind of like these upgrade problems. You depend on something that doesn't work on the new Java release, then or probably transitively. So you have to wait until that project updates, and then the the you know the three layers between your project and that project that are in your dependency tree they have to update. So, and that's exactly where I think strong encapsulation plays such a big role for the future for the future of the ecosystem. Um, the harder basically <laughs> the the uh, the JDK uh, uh, comes down on these internal users the less likely they will be that you have anywhere in your dependency these, inter uh, dependency tree, these internal users. And that means that it's much easier to update. You don't have to wait until like five, five steps removed, somebody updates their, their code and then the next one and next one, and eventually you. But you already know that none of them use anything that's going to change. So you can probably just update the Java version without updating anything else. And I think that's, uh, that's a very important improvement. That's what I mentioned earlier, right? I think that's a very positive outcome of the, of the module system specifically or of strong encapsulation. And that's, uh, you're not going to see that. You're not going to have, like, you can't just say, OK, every six months, we're going to act as, as if we save three developer days of uh, breaking dependencies, because that's, <laughs> that's, that's not how it works. Uh, but that's what's going to happen. And that's a positive impact that's very hard to measure, but that's none, nonetheless 
uh, will materialize. And that's why I'm such a fan of this entire change. And I think that more of us, and I'm, I'm pretty sure more of us will, um, start using modules for the same reason, because it's not only JDK internals, maybe I'm using Spring internals. Maybe it's not even on purpose. Maybe some developer, just not like, yeah, the, the package is called internal, but let me use it nonetheless, and bam, now you're depending on some Spring-specific version. That's not good either. So I think in general that plays out. Like, the more modules, the better. So, okay, that was my modules. <laughs> oh, oh, and I wrote a book. Right? So now I got all the things in that I get paid for. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think it makes sense. Uh, it's high time for developers to take the warnings more seriously because um, we all know that we ignore the warnings, but I think it's not a good thing to do now. And um, do you think it, uh, would you suggest developers to test their applications with every new version, even if they are not transitioning to that version so that they know, uh, they get to know the warnings that pop up and they know that these are the changes that they need to make to their application so that when they are actually moving to probably a later version, things don't break. Yes, absolutely. Right, so uh, whatever version that you're baseline against, uh, what I would recommend to build against, if you have the chance, and you know, the more modern your build environment is, the easier it gets, uh, build on, so, Build on every LTS since then, because there's a good chance that your customers or users are using that. Um, build on the latest, if that's not LTS, and then also build on EA. So let's say you're in Java 8 right now. In a year's time, I would recommend build against 11 and 17 because they're LTS, build against uh, 19 because it just came out, and 20 EA. And again, not every build, right? That takes a lot of time. Just do it once nightly, that's fine. Um, and then you can see. 11 and 17 will tell you, or 11, 17, and 19 will tell you where users may be at, and 20 will tell you about the future, and that way you can uh, make informed decisions. So let's let's just create uh, paint uh, some example. Let's say you're using something in Java 8, in Java 8 code base, that has been deprecated in 9 and removed in 11. Imagine not knowing about that and writing code for three years now, and maybe three more years, piling more and more code onto that thing that you could already know is gone. That makes it so much worse when it eventually does get removed. So I think it's, uh, as I said, in the not li not likely case, but not the chance not zero that one of these changes impact you negatively. Uh, the earlier you get to know, the better. Yeah, I think if you've got um, any sort of continuous environment, continuous integration environment, it just makes sense to have that running on more than one version of Java. Like you don't have to be using Java in production or even when you're developing, you don't have to use all those different versions. But you need something running somewhere. If you've got CI and automated tests, it would be a waste of having CI if you didn't make the most of that. Yeah. Oh, one more thing that you can also do, by the way, you can just, let's, for example, say you built for, you have a baseline of 11, you can build with a 17 compiler and tell it to generate, you know, build this project on 17 for 11. Um, that would also work. There was a question in the chat about if there's a tool in IntelliJ IDEA to upgrade from Java 11 to Java 17. I wanted to use that as a lovely segue to talk a little about a bit about, um, about inspections that it's not it's not a migration tool, so I am going to go slightly off topic, but I'm going to allow us to talk about the stuff we want to talk about, which is um, one of the things I love about IntelliJ is how um, the inspections can help us use new language features. So I was hoping that maybe Tagir might talk a little bit about some of those. Um, I don't know if you want to call up specific ones or I'm leaving it open. <laughs> can I, can um, I open a bug, an issue right here? No. <laughs> <laughs> At least, okay. I was, no, not to be, I was not expecting to be shut down this hard. I mean, Hagi, I'll leave well, the stage to you then. <laughs> well, uh, if you want to upgrade your project from 11 to 17 in IntelliJ IDEA, all you have to do is to uh, bump the version in the drop down or probably change the version in your POM XML. And you are done, you upgrade because Java is compatible, you will not have any problems. Uh, but, uh, of course... Wait, wait, uh, wait. You won't have any problems except for all the stuff that got removed between 11 and 17, maybe. Uh, yes. <laughs> you make it sound bad, <laughs> uh, Okay, no, well, 11 I mean, to 17 is, is fine. 11 to 17 is going to be minimal things, right? I, I mean, it's going to be fine. You, you, you won't get any problems and asterisks, uh, asterisk and, and a footnote. <laughs> but, uh, of course... Uh, mm, uh, you want to uh, also use new features and uh, well you can use them gradually but uh, there is also a way to use some of them in mass just like uh, convert existing code uh, to use new features make uh, make existing code like more compact more concise and uh, we provide uh, some migration inspections uh, the biggest thing 
uh, between 11 and 17 is probably migrating from um, uh, old style switches to new style switches to switch expressions and uh, sometimes this may uh, reduce amount of lines like threefold because uh, you can remove uh, intermediate like uh, variable assignments intermediate break statements i hate breaks and switches and uh yes exactly, <laughs> exactly. i hate breaks so much <laughs> <laughs> you will have very short and very nice switch statement, uh, switch expression. And uh, now with patterns and switch, uh, you will be able to convert many if chains to switches as well. Uh, we had uh, quite a good experience with migration in Java 8 when Stream API was introduced. So uh, many for loops could be converted into stream chains in just one K press. Well, sometimes conversion is uh, uh, doesn't make your code like uh, much better. It's just uh, okay, uh, loop was clear as well. Stream is also clear, but okay. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, the conversion makes it really, uh, really great. For example, if you are joining string with separator inside the for loop, you have to check whether it's the last iteration or not last or something like this. And IntelliJ may recognize it and say, why, why? you can use just collect joining and everything will be in one line. So one of the things I love, sorry, one of those, the things I love about those inspections are exactly what you just said. You can, you can change the code to use the new, to, you can change your code to use a new format. And if you don't like it, you can always change it back again. And, and that's what I love is it allows you to kind of experiment with new features. Does it make your code more readable? Does it make, does it make it more understandable to you? And I like the fact that it's not just forcing you to use the new features just for the sake of it. It's like, hey, have you seen? You could do it this way if you want. Can, can, yes, like exactly. can I turn the inspections off for some instance of code? Like, okay, I, I like the inspection, inspection, keep it on, but for this specific instance, turn it off? Uh, you can suppress it via comment or via suppress annotation. Uh, well, okay. it will be explicitly written in that code place because it should be written somewhere. Uh, and uh, another thing we changed between 11 and 17 is conversion of regular classes to records because sometimes you have a class with final fields and uh, constructor with just assigns those final fields and nothing stops you to convert it to records and there is an automatic conversion and if you don't like favorite, you can convert that's back. my favorite one because it just takes these enormous classes of like you know 50 lines and gives you like a three line record <laughs> like wow well, why was i doing that uh, it's it's not perfect for, uh, right now for example it cannot uh understand that if your hash code uh could be converted with preserving semantics because it's it's too hard but uh, I, probably we will improve it I, I was gonna ask about that yeah i noticed that uh, equals and hash code don't get uh, removed i mean two string neither but i guess two string makes sense because it's technically not the same string that you're getting um but what about hash code and like because if i generate uh, hash code with like with intellij right like just like give me hash code and two string uh, sorry hash code and equals the versions that i get Aren't those like the same thing that the record implementation does? So couldn't IntelliJ at least record at least? Um, okay, now I'm gonna do the thing that that you know. I said like, can't you just? You, it's obviously not that easy. I'm asking you why it's not easy. Yes, um, Nikolai. Yes, yes, it can. And I guess we have open issue for this, and hopefully it will be fixed in some foreseeable future. Uh, at very least, in many cases, hash code and equals are generated automatically via templates, and I guess we can recognize uh, widely used templates and just say, OK, uh, we can just remove this. And yeah, that would be really but, great. I also like the other thing I like about that inspection is that because records don't use the get prefix, they just use the name of the the record, uh, what's it called? The rec component. record component. component. Um, then I like the fact that you have the option in IntelliJ IDEA to, to say, I do want you to get rid of get everywhere in my code, and I want you to use the new record thing, or not. I want it. I want to keep it as a get. So I like the fact that you can customize that inspection so that it it, gen it, it changes the code the way you want it to. I also think, by the way, that uh, learning via inspections is uh, a stellar example of like learning in, when you're in, in the exact right context. I mean, it's great to learn from YouTube videos and from, from presentations and from courses and trainings. But all of that is not the context that you work in, right? You're in a different, you now have to start 
start thinking about, okay, what's this example code doing? What am I thinking about the example code? Okay, there's an the improvement. But if your uh, IDE can do that, like in the situation where we're actually writing the business code right now, and says, okay, in this specific context, this is this is the improvement. Let me show you. I think that has a, that's that's probably the best way to learn. Well, uh, well, also a little asterisk because I think it also makes sense to learn more about the basics of the feature. But that aside, like because it's so great because you're already in the context, you already know what the code is doing, and seeing that change there, which is you know in all likelihood an improvement, then you can just oh, okay, oh, it could do that as well. That's so great. So I really think that's just literally a good way to learn I, I don't think that should be like oh no you should just you know learn the feature by heart before and then write it all out by hand not at all i think uh when you encounter such a thing you want to like wait i didn't know switch can do that then maybe that's a good time you know to make a note and then you know later in the week learn a little bit about, more about that switch feature but in general i think right in that place is the best way to learn about um, a new feature because you already know everything about the code that you would need to know to see the improvement understand what the new code is doing and you can really focus on not understanding the example but understanding you know the new feature that's that shows up there I remember times when I were actively answering on Stack Overflow and uh, there were many questions about uh, Stream API because Stream API was relatively new and uh, there were many questions like, for example, I have an ordinary loop, for loop like this and how it can be converted to Stream API in the most canonical way and people would try to answer something, but uh, I uh, come and write answer like uh, just press alt enter in IntelliJ <laughs> and it will <laughs> provide you canonical for loop for your code and canonical stream for your code it will be the best option there's a there's a question in the chat which is a great question we, we kind of asked it a little bit at the beginning but I want to I want to specifically talk about it which is that how can we how can developers convince their companies to move to Java 17 or perhaps at least off Java 8. <laughs> Um, I want to I want to poke that a little bit at Nikolai first. My usual answer to this question is um, performance and security. Do we have any benchmarks or interesting things around the performance side of stuff, the performance improvements over the last few versions of Java? Um. Okay, so first I want to say two things. Uh, well, it's, it's the same thing. I'm not an expert in performance. I'm not an expert in security. And both of these are very complex topics that are easy to get wrong. So uh, don't take my word for anything. Always, you know, look those things up specifically. Uh, I think the challenge with performance benchmarks is um, that, you know, they only apply to specific, specific projects. So what I would say that most projects will see an improvement in performance when they go from 8 or 11 to 17 for a variety of reasons that we don't have to necessarily go into, many like small low-level refactorings, but then also new garbage collections. So there's a lot of stuff going on there um, that, that you might see or might not even see while you're, while you're using it. So there's a bunch to be gained potentially. Then it always comes down to your project, to your workload. And it's also not easy to, to reliably benchmark an application, right? Like do, how do you generate you know, this, this, the, the data that, uh, some, uh, the, that you, um, for example, throughout your web backend to make sure that it's realistic. So that's like a whole complex topic. And while I think by now every project or most projects have like a good code base and a good continuous integration build, it's much harder to really get a reliable um, to get a reliable performance benchmark suit as well for your project. So what I can say is what I would definitely recommend is to just give it a try. Um, like as I said, if you build against the early access builds already, you should know what you what version you can already use. Uh, and if you can benchmark performance, all the better. Do that, definitely. I think there's a good chance that you will see improvements, but you know, there's a chance that you don't. So uh, before you make before making a decision based on performance, always measure. And since you can always get the latest uh, OpenJDK builds from you know a bunch of different places, um, including JDK Java Net, which is probably the canonical source, um, you can always you know just try it out and then see you know whether you want to take the next step. When it comes to security, I can highly recommend Sean Mullen's blog. He's um, he's working on the security team at Oracle, and he has like it's he's like clockwork. Every six months, he has a new uh, blog post. These are the only blog posts, and they're always called like I think JDK twelve security improvements up to like JDK seventeen security improvements, and they're obviously a bunch of uh, just fixes, like just like you know things that just got improved, but they're also specific features that target. Uh, Security, for example, there was a serial deserialization filter introduced, I think, in Java 9, um, which was helping you to defend against denial of service attacks that came by sending you malformed uh, serialized data to accessible 
um, are my endpoints. And then in Java 17, I want to say actually, there's like uh, this, it got it got uh, improved, and now you can more specifically define how to interact with that with that um, uh, with that functionality, so you can more easily deny um, serialization. Um, serialized uh, stuff that you get sent before even deserializing it, before even investing the time, the CPU time that would eventually lead to a denial of service attack if somebody overwhelms you with that. So there are specific features, um, but then there's also just like general improvements. And once again, strong encapsulation does play a role here. Um, uh, knowing that when you launch your web backend, none of your dependencies um, break into internal APIs is good to know. It protects the uh, the integrity and stability of the JDK that you're running. Oh, and also, by the way, talking about strong encapsulation, it's not like you cannot opt out not of the whole thing, but our specific packages, you can. Like, if you make the conscious decision that this feature is worth enough to me uh, to open this specific, I don't know, JDK package for reflection or whatever, then you can, of course, still do that. Uh, I think the big improvement here is that what cannot happen is that your dependency does that without you knowing. Your dependency can still do that. It will tell you to add exports or add opens, and then it's your turn to consider this, think through the implications, and if you think it's worth it, go ahead and do it. Uh, but you can now make this informed decision. So that's, I think, a big part of the security boon and performance, as you said. Um, there's more, of course. I mean, obviously, we talked about uh, some of the features that give you more productivity. That's always a big boon. But something that, that I like to mention, uh, not because it's such uh, it's so important, but it get, gets easily overlooked. I hear it's hard to hire developers. Imagine when you can tell your, your applicants whether you can work in JDK 4, since we had that example a couple of times, 8, 11, or 17. Do you think it will make a difference? Because frankly, I think it will. <laughs> so somebody offering me to work on their Java 6 code base, I'll be like, nope, thank you. I'll just, unless I get like, paid Fortran amounts of money, uh, <laughs> I probably wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> if if you are still on Java 8, you are missing even compact strings, and you can just uh, go to your boss and say, okay, uh, we have many strings in our heap, and all of them are like this. But if you simply migrate to 11, it will be like this. So all the zeros uh, from in between will be just uh, removed, and now they are wasted. You will save lots of memory in the heap. Do you have show notes? Do you have show notes? There's a great talk by uh, Alexis Shipilev where he explained that journey towards that refactoring. And it's, it's, it's amazing, it's interesting, it's funny, and it's, it's such a good talk. Uh, and yeah, so the gist is you can save 10 or 20% of your memory consumption depending on how much strings you use just by updating past eight. Just without anything else that we talked about, you just get that for free. Uh, Nicola, I want to interrupt the flow now because a lot of questions are coming in regarding uh, how to convince the companies to move to Java 17. And in yesterday's uh, session, I also noticed uh, some information about the change in the licensing for Java 17 and how soon the LTS version would be released. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so uh, so that's actually uh, two quite important changes that uh, that we announced yesterday. So one of them is and that's uh, somewhat related to the OpenJDK community that Oracle considers or proposed to make the next LTS version after 17, uh, not 23 in three years, but 21 in two years. And while technically I mentioned earlier that LTS is a, mostly a vendor concept, Oracle should, could just say like, that's what we're gonna do. Um, but you know, since, since it is a community and since it does make sense for vendors to coordinate what will be LTS, just like the six months uh, release cadence and the three years LTS cadence, I was discussed on the OpenJDK mail mailing list. So is this. Uh, so if any opinions on this, uh, there's the Java train hashtag on Twitter, and then there's the OpenJDK mailing list uh, discussion about that. Mark Reynolds proposed that. And I expect that to go through unless there's like an over overwhelming number of people who are like, no, no, I don't want LTS every two years for whatever reason. Uh, so what I expect to happen is that this will get accepted or um, Oracle will do that uh, to make uh, 21 the next LTS. And then probably most or all vendors will uh, probably adopt that similar cycle, which will mean that uh, it eases a bit the tension between developers potentially wanting to upgrade every six months because they like the incremental upgrades and they understand that it's not actually more work than making the big jumps. Whereas, uh, you know, enterprise sometimes are a bit slower and they like you know to have like less steps because apparently it's easier to run a marathon if you jump four meters for every step uh, so um, right so uh, so this tension is of course with six months and three years a bit larger than with six months and two years so that eases that tension a bit that's good and I also think it will make 
it easier to try this six month thing thing right you went from 11 to 17 now recently hopefully you will see oh that wasn't that bad so maybe i can try that and you know go 18 and 19 and then like the stretch you have to make before you have the next save point in this game of development is shorter so that's that's good i guess uh, so that's one big change that's uh, related to how uh, oracle offers long-term support but also involves the rest of the open jdk community and the other aspect that's the license of oracle jdk which is uh just just an oracle thing and that there's some potential for confusion here because um oracle i think oracle is not even the only vendor who does that they have like several offerings of of jdk's it's, so there's the oracle open jdk which is the stuff you can get at jdk java net which is gpl licensed and then there's the oracle jdk which you get at oracle.com slash something just google oracle and java and you'll probably find it um so these are two different different these are totally different things even though they're like 99 percent the same code um but they are like like technically speaking they're still different and specifically legally uh, speaking they used to be very different in the past because you could not use open sorry you could not use oracle jdk uh in production for free and that changed now so starting with 17 all the Oracle JDKs, you can use that in production for free. You get the same updates. You get the same JDKs that uh, the paying customers get. What you don't get is, you know, all the customer hotline stuff. Probably also don't get cold calls, so that's good. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. So uh, so all the things that comes with the Java SE subscription, like GraalVM and all of that, uh, that's, of course, not in there. It's just really just you get the updates, the Oracle JDK um, version for free. And the LTS versions, like 17, you get this updates for three years. So what you can do now is you can stay on Oracle JDK for three years. And then in two years, you could already consider jumping to the next LTS version. And uh, those are two very good changes. And the third one, which is, seems smaller, but will also have a big impact, is that finally, <laughs> we don't need a click through on the license, <laughs> which is yay. <laughs> and also, uh, we have now uh, URLs where you can predictably download them. So you can as uh, assume that, you, that the tools that you use, like GitHub Actions or um, like SDK Man, which I really like to use a lot, that those can at some point also offered the JDK of Java Steward, which was missing and which was a bit sad. Uh, and now it's there. That's great. We actually, Intelli so IntelliJ Idea, just to put in the plug, you can download JDKs from inside IntelliJ Idea. So I can imagine that uh, it will be quite helpful for us to have like static URLs that we can go to for that sort of thing. Yeah. I, I also want to say that what I heard from the two years between LTSs is that we're getting Loom in two years' time. That's what I heard. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was what many people were like, oh my God, like Valhalla, Loom, and Panama, they're all not done for 17. Now they'll all be done for 21. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but that's to me that's a good that's a good motivation to move on to 17 like maybe you're not blown away by you should be blown away by some of the performance increases but maybe you're not blown away by that or the new features but like you really want to be on 17 so that you can easily upgrade to the more to the next ones which are coming which will have like you said like loom and valhalla and panama and like people might not know what those mean but they they will when they come out people are going to care about that sort of thing yeah and always the people ask me like what do you think about so many people staying on eight i have to say personally i don't worry too much like i would like everybody to upgrade of course but you can stay on eight indefinitely and well there are still people on six and some even older i had a youtube comment of somebody who said like some of the projects still on java 3 i think so uh 1.3 uh so yeah so but the most the, the, the largest portion of people or projects will at some point just move off of jdk8 just because like, who do you get support from? At some point, you just have to start paying, and nobody wants that. So I'm pretty sure that I don't worry too much that the adoption might be a bit slower. Of course, I like to see like to see faster, and I think there's a potential future where actually eight and seventeen get more adoption than eleven, just because everybody who made the, the step to eleven will then very easily probably make the one to seventeen, and basically we have like in the future potentially just a hump of eight that slowly decreases, and then the newest LTS will always have the most. Um, but yeah, people will have to move off eight. It's just like at some point anyway, and so they, they surely will. I'm, I'm positive that it happens. I guess many libraries will uh, gradually drop support yeah. of eight. So uh, if you stuck with eight, you also stuck with all versions of all your dependencies. And then updates become so much harder, right? If it's not just one thing, but you know, then you have to update in sync. Okay, you have to update like Spring and this dependency and that dependency and Java at the same time, or have to figure out which versions used to become. That makes everything much harder. Yes. I wanted to mention here, I was waiting for Malice to jump in. I did want to mention actually that um, the new, the latest version of the new version of Spring is going to be Java 17 baseline. Was that right? 
Yeah, I think they start working on it in a couple of weeks, and I think they want to ship it by next year's fall or something. And Spring 6 is going to be baselined again 17, which uh, uh, <laughs> sadly enough is probably going to do more for uh, for, Java, for Java 17 adoption than everything than anything I can say here. Uh, <laughs> but it's that's great. all about the community, though. It's all about how everything right. interacts together, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and I think that's great, right? I think that that that's that's the way it should be. Like projects should be like, okay, you know, let's not jump, let's not make 17 the baseline the day it comes out. Uh, let's wait for a while, but then also at the same time be conscious of the fact that everybody's life gets better if we move on. Also, the you know the programmers involved in Spring they 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 deserve some fun as well, uh, and deserve to be more productive and deserve to just like you know use the new features and that way they can uh, use new features and also enable their users to make it easier. Most obviously was Java eight right, an API that was using streams in the right places was better and easier to use than the same library a year ago that didn't. So those kinds of changes um, are, will will increase increase the productivity of everybody, and they will also, you know, like give you more incentive uh, to update to recent versions. Trisha, I, I was going through the sorry. I, no, I go on. Go on. <laughs> I was going through the comments to, just to pick up any uh, comment that we need to pick up because we are running out of time. So that was why I was quiet and. I was reading the comments. I, I thought you were going to say our time's up. We're going. I, um, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to say one last thing, and then I'm going to assume that we're out of time. Um, in terms of, and we've kind of alluded to this, but in terms of tips my, for migrating, like I think the best thing that that you that one can a developer can do for their application is make sure all your dependencies are up to date. Make sure Maven and Gradle are up to date, and then you may find that Java 17 just works and it's absolutely fine. You don't have to update IntelliJ. That already works with the recent yeah, version. Well, exactly. <laughs> it's all fine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Update all the things first. I know that's not easy. But if if you can do that, uh, depending on the project, that might not be easy. If you can do that, that's the best preparation for any Java update. And we do have a new panel in IntelliJ IDEA 2021.2, which is the dependencies panel. And it will automatically tell you which dependencies can be upgraded and to what version. It's really oh, cool. Oh, cool. That's like Dependabot, but not annoying. Right. <laughs> Um, can I also plug a few things? Because uh, like, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, there is a ton of things online that I want to recommend. There's dev.java, the website we launched yesterday, which contains a lot of, uh, of various tutorials, and it will grow in the future. So check that out, dev.java. Then there's inside.java, which is basically more of an inside view of the OpenJDK. It's more or less like a collection of posts that are interesting on the mailing list, blog posts, videos that we make that highlight the evolution of OpenJDK. So you're closer to what's happening right now in the future. That's inside.java. And then go to the Java YouTube channel and watch uh, the Inside Java newscast, which sponsors me. And there are other videos, but you don't need those. Just watch mine. <laughs> I get paid by YouTube clicks. Please go there, please. <laughs> um, I wanted to mention one more thing, because a bunch of people have asked about live demos and stuff. And we didn't do a live demo in this stream. But I did want to plug Mala's video, because she's going to be too, too um, what's the right word, uh, shy to plug her own video. Mala will be doing a Java 17 in IntelliJ IDEA video. Uh, won't you, Mala? And it'll be a, that will be a live demo. Live, live. That will be a demo of the Java 17 features in IntelliJ IDEA, um, and it will be on this YouTube channel. Oh, I will. Right. I will try it live. I have, a, I have an source project that I want to see how much it changes with Java 17. On, on tomorrow evening, I'm going to stream that on Twitch, so you can see me using IntelliJ. But it's not scripted. It's not prepared. So it's going to be a lot of mm and ah, and I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, so you can watch, watch that as well. Watch Nikolai's first, and then watch Mala's scripted video. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, <laughs> or just skip mine. And just watch the good version directly. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I'll have to uh, kind of. Uh, stop our conversation now because we are already out of time now uh thank you so much thanks everyone nikolai tagir trisha for having the conversation today i know there were a lot of questions uh, which are still unanswered because this is what i mentioned in the beginning that this is not a small topic we would be having a lot of questions and we'll try to answer as much questions as we can but of course we might not be able to do that because this was just an hour long session uh, the main uh, reason was to get everyone started talking about Java 17 and to look into ways on how they can move to the new version. Of course, there would be companies who would be talking about now, we don't want to do that, where's the money, where's the time. But of course, uh, we would be having ecosystem, the libraries that we work with, the frame uh, frameworks that we work with migrate to the new version. And as the baseline changes, we'll have to move our applications to the new versions 
sooner or later. And uh, of course, Intelligent Idea has amazing inspections, uh, context actions. And I would mention that just one now, which is a running inspection by name, which is an amazing a uh, feature in which uh, developers can run one particular inspection and migrate their code to that particular feature, to use that particular language feature. Uh, now, I would request closing comment by uh, each one of you. Nikolai. Uh, For once, I'm going to be short. Uh, regarding <laughs> okay. that, let's, let's say, where's the money coming from? Let's say you cannot afford not to move to 17 for productivity reasons, for security reasons, for uh, for performance reasons, and for just having more fun while work reasons. Tagir. Uh, I second to Nikolai. Uh, upgrade uh, to Java 17, try new features. If you see any problems in Java, report to Java mailing list. If you see any problems in IntelliJ, report to us. I thought you were going to say also report to the mailing list. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just leave us out of it. <laughs> sure. Um, yes. I, so my my advice is just try it. You might find that Java seventeen just works. I think a lot of people get put off by things which sound scary, and you a lot of applications that I've tried migrating from eight to something um, later, they actually just worked, and and that's great. So give it a go, and IntelliJ will help you use the new features as you go along. And stay tuned for uh, IntelliJ Idea live streams, and we would have another one for you next month. And until then, bye. 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 Goodbye. Thank you again. It was fun. <laughs>